Coming up, he's an advisor to the Donald and could be his number two. Newt Gingrich joins us to size up the presidential race. And then... I never wanted to quit this. <gasps> never. A thief gets robbed of his freedom. I had nowhere to go. Absolutely nowhere to go. Plus, TBN's Matt and Lori Crouch join us live on today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. You know, Republicans are somewhat dismayed. They want to line up behind their front runner, Donald Trump. But just about the time he's got them on board, he cuts loose with some crazy uh, attack on some lesser figure. And people are saying, why are you doing that? Will you ever stop attacking people and be presidential? Terry. Well, this latest one has been about a judge that yeah. is in charge of this whole Trump University uh, lawsuit. Trump says the judge is Mexican of Me Mexican descent and won't give him a fair trial because he wants to build a wall between the United States and Mexico. Dale Hurd has that story. Donald Trump is refusing to back down in his contention that federal judge Gonzalo Curiel could not preside over a fair trial in a fraud case against Trump University because his parents were born in Mexico. I'm He's a member of a, a uh, club or society, very strongly pro-Mexican, which is all fine. But I say he's got bias. I want to build a wall. I'm going to build a wall. And Trump a went further. If it were a Muslim judge, would you also feel like they wouldn't be able to treat you fair, fairly because of that policy of yours? Uh, it's possible, yes. Yeah, that would be possible, absolutely. Isn't there sort of a tradition, though, in America that we don't judge people by who their parents were and where they came from? I'm not talking about tradition. I'm talking about common sense, okay? Former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, a Trump supporter and widely considered to be a possible running mate, severely criticized Trump's remarks. This is one of the worst mistakes Trump has made. I think it's inexcusable. This judge was born in Indiana. He is an American, period. But Gingrich added he considers Trump a remarkable leader who learns very quickly. Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton grabbed the chance to aim her fire at Trump. What Trump is doing is trying to divert attention uh, from uh, the very serious fraud charges against uh, Trump University. And on NBC's Meet the Press, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell also criticized Trump, but he would not say if he thought what Trump said was racist. Is that not a racist statement? No, I couldn't disagree more with a statement like that. Is it a racist statement? I couldn't disagree more with what he, what he had to say. Republican leaders were urging Trump to start unifying the party and start acting like a potential leader of the United States. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, we just hope that there's so many people that want so badly to see a change in administration. They want to see different policies, and they think that Trump may be the man to bring them in. But somehow or other, somebody's got to say to him, you know, when I was growing up, uh, there was a great fighter. His name was Joe Lewis. He was one of the most famous boxers around. And what they used to say was, Joe Lewis, don't fight in bars. You know, the great fighters go into the ring in front of a whole lot of people, and then they pick their battles, but they don't go into brawls in bars. And uh, Trump is going for the biggest job in the world to be the leader of the free world. And as such, you don't to go engage in barroom brawls. You just don't do it. And uh, somebody's got to say, remember Joe Lewis, he don't fight in bars. Former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, is joining us now from Washington. Uh, welcome, uh, Newt. You, you, you let the presumptive leader have it. Uh, what's your take on this? Well, first of all, I love your Joe Lewis line, and it's exactly right. You know, uh, Trump can decide to win battles or uh, Trump can decide to win the presidency. I'm not sure he can do both. Uh, but, you know, Reagan went through something like this, Pat. You'll remember uh, back in August of 1980, they spent almost a month getting reorganized because they were just off message. Things weren't working. Uh, they clearly weren't going to beat Jimmy Carter unless they got their act together. So hopefully Trump is having that challenge a few months earlier. But clearly the, the, the jump from 
uh, being a candidate in the primary to being the candidate and leader of his entire party uh, is a really profound change. I, I said it was like shifting from being a golfer where all the decisions were Trump's to being the leader of a football team where the rest of the team has to know where you're going so they can execute their play. But, but let me just also point out, the biggest political news last week wasn't what Trump said. The biggest political news was Friday's jobs report where the number of jobs created was so tiny that we created in America last month one job for every 8,000 Americans. Now, Hillary can't carry that kind of a burden into the general election and win. Uh, if the Obama big government, big bureaucracy, high cost policies continue to crush the economy, I think that's going to defeat Hillary. Uh, and all of these uh, political noises are going to be much less important to the average American than what's happening to their pocketbook uh, and to their job. Um, if Trump is the winner, uh, what would you tell him the priorities should be for those first 100 days that are so crucial? Well, I mean, first of all, he, he has to build the wall because he said he would, and I think it's important to keep faith with the American people. And I think for him to back off would be to cripple the very authenticity. Has. Second, I'd say focus on jobs, cut regulations, uh, sign the agreement for the, T the Keystone Pipeline, introduce a tax plan to make it desirable uh, to create jobs in America, to stay in America, uh, renegotiate in a very tough way. You know, when you learn from the director of national intelligence in a public testimony that the Chinese last year stole $360 billion in intellectual property of the United States, we have every right to be very tough negotiators. Uh, free trade doesn't mean stupid trade, and it doesn't mean letting somebody be a crook. Uh, and I think that there are things Trump could do in the first 30 to 60 days that would really set the stage for a dramatic rebound towards a Reagan-style economy where we grow at 5 or 6 or 7% a year. Do you think he's buying that? Is, is that? is that what's on his heart, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, the, the frustrating thing with, with Trump is that the big picture stuff is really amazing. He's come an extraordinary distance in one year. Nobody has ever come from outside politics as decisively as he has. He's clearly articulating what millions and millions of Americans feel. And on, on the big things, I think he is a remarkable leader. And he's just got to get a little better at some of the small things. Uh, and I think at that point, he becomes very formidable. Well, you know, the president seems to be ruling by decree these days without Congress, without anybody. He's just making these decisions and sending out letters telling people about transgender bathrooms and all this sort of thing. Uh, Trump could, uh, with executive order, he could cancel a great uh, deal of the Obama uh, uh, confusion that's been going on, can't he? Yeah, he can. And I think they ought to plan to have the first two or three days spent just literally wiping out the non-legal things and the non-constitutional things that Obama has been doing. And I know that there are several groups working on this, uh, developing a whole set of uh, new uh, repeal orders, if you will. And I think that just in itself would send a remarkable signal to the country. He's also got to come in with a very key reform that allows us to fire corrupt, criminal and dishonest uh, federal employees. Right now, uh, the unions have such a uh, grip on the federal government that even if somebody's a crook, it's almost impossible to fire them. You're not going to run the federal government the way Trump wants to until you get the power to get rid of people who refuse to obey orders, who in some cases are criminal and in many cases are corrupt. Well, does that go back to the Hatch Act? Or what, what, what is preventing... No, uh, go, no go, it would go all the way back to the Pendleton Act of 1883. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, it just gives you a sense of how structured. You know, my, my favorite example is in the Veterans Administration, which is really important to our veterans and really terribly run. Uh, and in Puerto Rico, the union won an argument that a woman who had pled guilty to armed robbery had to be reinstated in the Veterans Administration because her two immediate bosses were a convicted sex offender and a, a convicted drug abuser. And therefore, since they were both convicted, it wasn't appropriate to not rehire her just because she'd engaged in iron robbery. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Th these are sick organizations. <laughs> no, you can't. That's too fantastic. Well, listen, uh, going to your own personal, uh, you've been uh, put in one of the top lists of vice president. Are you interested in that at all? Or, or have you? Have they oh, talked I, to look, you? I mean, Calista and I believe you have to serve the country. Uh, we did just something I know be close to your heart. 
We just finished a wonderful movie, The First American, mm -hmm. about George Washington, premiered it at Mount Vernon. So we're doing a lot of things we're really enjoying. Um, you know, I think we'd have to wait and see. I, I, I would be uh, open to talking about it, because as a citizen, I think you should always be prepared to serve your country. Uh, but I would want to understand that it was a substantive job uh, and not just a cheerleader job uh, in order to really seriously consider it. Who are the people right now? Has he put together a um, conference of wise men, as they say, to, to advise him? I don't think so. You I don't? Think, <laughs> this, this, this is a guy who has been astonishingly competent by listening to himself. Uh, he, he called me one. He, you know, he he called me months ago and said, uh, you know, he wanted some advice about something. I said, look, you operate off of a set of intuitions I don't understand. They're objectively working. My patterns are very different than yours. I will just mess you up if I try to get you to do what I do, uh, because we have such very different operating styles. And so I have great respect for his abilities. I do think getting a wider and wider circle. He met recently with Henry Kissinger. He met recently with Jim Baker. I think he's beginning to reach out in a serious way. Uh, and he ultimately needs to have kind of a kitchen cabinet of very senior people who can sit down with him and close, behind closed doors tell him what uh, he needs to hear, even if he doesn't want to hear it. But I think he'll get there. I think he's come an amazing distance in just one year. Do you think he's going to win? Probably. I think it's very hard to take one job for every 8,000 Americans, mm. the failure in Libya, the failure in Russia, the failure in Syria, go down the list. Uh, Hillary Clinton has lots of words and no achievements. And I think that it's very hard to carry that to the presidency. Do you think there's any possibility that Loretta Lynch is going to allow an indictment to go forward against Hillary? I think it's possible. I mean, Lynch mm -hmm. has got to ask herself, does she want to play the role of the obstructors in Watergate or the role of the people who cleaned it up? And, and I don't know that she wants to go down in history as an attorney general who turned down the FBI. What we don't know, in all sincerity, uh, is what the FBI will recommend. We, we have no guarantee that they'll recommend indictment, even though the more we learn, there's not only a national security issue, there's a public corruption issue, uh, which uh, Bernie Sanders uh, talked about yesterday when he said that taking money from dictatorships in the Clinton Foundation while she was Secretary of State, uh, is very clearly a conflict of interest. Mm. Well, Newt, thank you so much for being well, with us. We good. wish you the best, and if you're the Vice President, we'll support you 100%. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. <laughs> right. God bless you. You're a tremendous friend for many, many years, and one of the most articulate people in the United States of America, Newt Gingrich, former Speaker of the House of Representatives. Terry. Well, still ahead, a reunion of soldiers who made Israeli history. We're going to join the celebration of Jerusalem Day coming up later. And welcome back to the 700 Club. The IRS is finally revealing the names of more than 400 Tea Party and other conservative groups it targeted three years ago. The Washington Times reports the names were released only because several federal judges demanded them in order to consider a class action case against the IRS. It turns out the IRS actually targeted 466 groups, a much higher number than the 298 first revealed. Jay Sekulow of the American Center for Law and Justice said it will take continued lawsuits to expose the IRS targeting scheme. Christians in Nigeria are demanding protection from authorities after a woman was stabbed to death for allegedly insulting Muhammad. Nigerian police say two suspects are in custody, but spokesmen for Nigeria's Christian Association say they face a looming religious crisis there and that police aren't doing enough to protect them. One spokesman accusing police of trying to cover up the killing. Well, 49 years ago, the 1967 Six-Day War changed the face of the Middle East and the world as Israel took control of all of Jerusalem. Israelis still commemorate that event, and they took to the streets Sunday to celebrate Jerusalem Day. Chris Mitchell brings us that story. You're watching a reunion of soldiers who made history. These are the paratroopers who captured the old city and reunited Jerusalem. 
It marked the first time in nearly 2,000 years that the Jewish people controlled all of their ancient capital. Katja Kahaner helped lead the charge. I can tell you just one thing that one of the commanders of the Jordan army told me later about the war in Jerusalem. He, he said, we fought like lions, but you fought like people that ready to give their life for Jerusalem. You've sounded a call that's gone through the generations. The Friends of Zion Museum honored Katya and his men. It's so important to have them here today, to honor them as heroes, to recognize uh, their efforts on behalf of the Jewish people. So much of what we're doing here today, so much of what we take for granted, might not have been possible without them. The reunion was just one part of a nationwide celebration of Jerusalem Day. Each year, Israelis celebrate Jerusalem Day. It's a day filled with flag-waving ceremonies and remembering the importance of what happened nearly a half century ago. Many see the reunification of Jerusalem as a milestone in history and prophecy. The prophet Isaiah said about Zion, joy and gladness will be found in it, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. That's exactly what's happening here. Every time that we walk through a park and see an old couple sitting on a bench, every time that we see a group of young kids playing soccer in Jerusalem, that is the prophecy of Zechariah coming to life before our eyes. For this band of brothers who liberated the city, it marked their lives. If somebody asked me, how would I describe my life? I would say Jerusalem. Every time I come to Jerusalem, on the way to Jerusalem, when I go up the hill of the castle, I feel the blossom of my heart. I feel something different. Jerusalem is part of our history, you know, for sure, and all everyone know from the Bible that the stories about Jerusalem. And I'm not religious at all, but I, I know what uh, we had to do to be homeland of the Jewish people, and that's it. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Pat, I like what that one man said. He said, how would I describe my life? One word, Jerusalem. Amazing. The Bible says, if I forget you, O oh, Jerusalem, my, my right hand learn, lose its cunning. You know, if I forget you, uh, I, I interviewed Yitzhak Karabin some time ago. He was the one who led the army. He was the one who was in charge of that group that stormed up the Mount of Olives. And uh, I remember the, seeing the haggard look of the Jordanian forces who were clearly beaten, but it was a hand-to-hand, -hand, uh, you know, slugfest till, till they took that old city. And the prophecy, Jesus made a prophecy that we were all looking for. It says, Jerusalem shall be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now in uh, 1967, that six-day war, that was the beginning of that prophecy. He said it will be it was the, the first time since uh, the days of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Jerusalem was now under the control of the Jews. It shall be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles. This is the first time that all of Jerusalem was under the Jewish control. And it's never going to go back. They're never going to divide the city. They cannot do it. And it, probably the last battle that will be fought will be a battle for Jerusalem. It isn't Armageddon. The troops, according to prophecy, will gather in Armageddon, but they're going to Jerusalem. The battle will be for Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of angels. So anyhow, keep your eye on Jerusalem. Terry. You know, I think another thing that mm. piece so clearly shows is the success they've had in passing on that passion yeah. and that yeah. ownership to it's the amazing. younger generation. I amazing. Mean, it's really wonderful. Yeah, they, they, they've got the feeling. Mm. But you know, the, the thing about politics, the United States Congress voted to move the American Embassy to Jerusalem. 
the State Department said that might offend the Arabs. We're not going to do it. And we're going to say the capital of, uh, of, uh, of Israel is in Tel Aviv. And they say it's nonsense. It's Jerusalem. That's where their headquarters are. That's where the Knesset is. That's where all their public uh, offices are. Oh, no, no, no. The State Department says we're not going to move our embassy. Well, one day, maybe under President Trump, they'll do it. Terry. Well, still ahead. He was trained to steal by his very own father. I always knew um, from the beginning that it was wrong. I just wanted my father to love me. That's all I've ever wanted. Just wanted, I wanted my father to love me. See how this thief finally found the love he longed for inside a prison cell. That's later on today's 700 Club. When Yaniati's son was born with a cleft lip, she was heartbroken. Then she had a second son who was also born with a cleft lip. And this time, she feared that the rumors surrounding her family might actually be true. Okto and Ari are brothers. Both were born with cleft lips. Many of my neighbors said that there was curse on my family. Two sons with cleft lip. I wondered if it was true. Then Yadiyadi's husband died, leaving her to provide for all of their children. She took his old job on a rubber plantation, but that barely provided food for them. Paying for surgery for the five and six-year-old Laoli brothers was out of the question. One day, a relative told Yaniati about CBN and the chance for free surgery for the boys. CBN brought Yaniati and the boys to a hospital in the city where surgeons repaired their cleft lips. When I saw that both of my son's lips were repaired, I couldn't believe it. Even now, my sons are more confident to play with other kids. Then to help her bring in a little extra money, we gave Yaniati some chickens to start a poultry business. First, I want to say thank you for the gift of surgery you provided for my sons. And I am so blessed with the hands that you gave me. I know the business will grow quickly. Thank you. You brought someone from the pit of despair to the peak of hope. I mean, this is a mom who had no means to help these two little boys of hers get their lips fixed. And without that surgery, they would have no hope and no future. If you're a 700 Club, this is, remember, this is the kind of hope and the kind of response and answer and love that you're bringing to the lives of people in need here at home and around the world. How does that work? It works when we all say, let's do this together. It means we link arms, we link our resources, we link our prayers, and we touch the world with the love of Jesus. 65 cents a day, $20 a month, makes you a 700 Club member. And we have lots of club levels for you to join at. So will you call our toll-free number today and become a part of reaching out to the rest of the world? Our number's toll-free, 1-800-759-0700. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. They'll tell you about our various club levels. You choose what you want to do and then live with expectancy and anticipation for the difference you're making in the world. Our way of saying thank you to you for caring about other people is to send you this. It's Pat's latest DVD and you are going to love this. Victory Through Life's Storms. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how much you have, we are all hit with storms in life and they usually come unexpectedly. Pat shares his history of victory through storms and the years that he's been in ministry, but there are lots of other testimonies on here as well. One woman who was paralyzed for 22 years and God healed her. You want to get this. It'll be a huge encouragement to you. At the same time, you'll be touching other lives. So call now, 1-800-759-0700. Pat? Thanks, Terry. Well, up next, a young man takes a hit of heroin and he's instantly hooked. I got up after inhaling this drug. I looked at him and I said, I don't know what that was, but I have a new habit. I never wanted to quit this. Never. He was addicted for nearly a decade. Watch how he kicked the habit overnight.
see true stories of people who overcame impossible odds in victory through life storms. I was just being wound up and beaten up against the frame. Discover the power of your words. There really is freedom from sickness and disease. Triumph in tough situations. This is your choice to walk away or to stay and fight for your marriage. And hear about God's plan for your life. God has a future and a destiny for every one of us. In Victory Through Life Storms, available now. Like father, like son, Neil Rosema first grabbed the attention of his dad, himself a professional thief, when he was caught stealing as a boy. From that point on, his father showed him the ins and out of his so-called trade. Years of stealing and drug addiction followed until Neil hit rock bottom in the floor of a small jail cell. I was told how much potential I had. If you're going to steal, let me teach you how to steal. Because kid, I'm either gonna show you diamonds or I'm gonna show you bars. Neil Rosema remembers the time he got caught stealing when he was eight. It was the same day his dad, a professional thief, finally gave him some attention. I found a way, found an avenue. This makes him happy, this has, him, this has us connected. And uh, that was the, the first time that I really ever felt like my father loved me. Over the next decade, he followed his dad's lead, learning the ins and outs of being a thief. But while it gave him time with his father, it came at a price. I always knew um, from the beginning that it was wrong. And I was never happy um, deep down inside with the person that I became. I just wanted my father to love me. That's all. That's all I've ever wanted. Just wanted, I wanted my father to love me. Neil started using pot, cocaine, and other drugs, but nothing killed the pain. Then a friend introduced him to heroin. As soon as I got up after inhaling this drug, I looked at him and I said, I don't know what that was, but I have a new habit. <laughs> I immediately felt peace. I felt calm. I felt like I didn't care. I never wanted to quit this. Never. For the next seven years, Neil supported his addiction by working in bars and stealing, which landed him in jail on several occasions. During that time, he suffered a devastating loss when his father passed away. But then he started dating Carrie, who was a Christian. We spent a lot of time together and just getting to know each other, and I fell in love with Neil, there's no question. The fact that someone this wonderful would even want to spend time with a guy like me, that, that brought me hope. There's a better way to live, and there's someone on this earth that might love me. As much as Neil cared for Carrie, he couldn't let go of his addiction and kept it hidden from her. I wanted to change, even if it was just for her, but I couldn't overcome it. Eventually, the two got engaged, but just weeks later, Neil was arrested for stealing a wallet from a gym locker and was put in jail. I was devastated to know that when she finds the truth, she's gonna leave. And the one person that loved me, that I knew loved me, I was gonna lose, and it was because of me. With no one to turn to, Neil called Carrie to post bond. By now, she had talked to a friend of Neil's who had told her everything. My heart just got ripped out, and I told him I, I didn't want to see him anymore, and I ended the relationship. When I put that phone down, I, I was in a daze because for the very first time in my life, I felt absolutely and completely alone even if I had the money to bond out that day, I had nowhere to go, absolutely nowhere to go. Neil returned to his cell. And for the first time in my life, and I've never done this, I looked up and I said, God, I'm all alone. I've hit rock bottom. I have nothing left. I have nothing more to, I can't give anymore. Tired of this. 
if you'll help me, if you'll protect me, help me get through this, I'll follow you for the rest of my life, no matter what. I collapsed and I fell on the floor and I couldn't move and I could feel something hovering over me and I could feel the warmth of something going through me and it felt like there were things inside being moved around, things being taken out, things being put back in and then all of a sudden it went completely quiet and it took everything I had just to climb up in my bunk and pass out. When I woke up the next morning after that, the desire for heroin was completely gone. All the, the, the terrible things that were inside of me weren't there anymore. For the first time in my life without chemicals, I felt peace, I felt love. Neil began praying, reading his Bible, and repenting for his actions. And a week later, he was called to the visitor room. There waiting for him was Carrie. I just told him everything that was on my heart. I felt like God had said that, you know, that he wanted me to stay with him and to pray with him and, and to fight for him. And if he was willing to do the right thing, that I would do that with him. God didn't have to do that. And the fact that he went above and beyond and brought the person that I loved the most in this whole entire world back to me, that sealed it for me. Neil was sentenced to four and a half years. He and Carrie used that time to grow in their relationship with each other and with God. Then immediately after his release in 2007, they married. Today, Neil is an operations manager for one of the largest landscaping companies in Illinois. But he says his most important roles are as a husband and father to their four children. Jesus never gives up on us. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what your addiction is. I don't care what you're struggling with. Give it up. Don't wait. He loves you unconditionally. Love, isn't it amazing? There's something inside of us, you and I, we want to be loved. We want, as little children, we want somebody to love us and hug us and be there for us. We want parents to love us. We want boyfriends and girlfriends to love us. We want a spouse, a wife, or a husband to love us. We want love. And the reason is that God himself is love. The Bible says God is love. He is love, not love being. He's love itself. And that's why we want love so badly, because we want to be part of him. And the thing is, he loves you, and like you heard, he loves unconditionally. He loves unconditionally. And if you want the love that will make you whole, it'll be, there's no amount of chemical, no amount of drug, no amount of alcohol, no amount of sex, no amount of money will make you whole, but the love of God will do it. And if you want love, real love, then I want you to pray with me right now. Bow your head and pray these words, Jesus, Jesus, that's right. I know you love me, Lord. And Lord, I know you died. And that's love that nobody understands. But you did it because you love me. And so I receive that love, Lord. And I ask you to come into my heart. And from this moment on, I will live for you and I will serve you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, thank you. And for those who prayed with me just then, I want you to go to your telephones and call in and say, look, I prayed with Pat. I've just given my heart to the Lord. And he has come into my life. It's a toll-free number, 1-800-759-0700. And for those who call, I want to give you a little thing that will help you. It's a CD in here that will tell you how to get started the Christian life, a new day. 1-800-759-0700. You've just found the love of God Almighty, and He's filling you. This is love.
not that we loved him, but that he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. Terry. Well, still ahead, Matt and Lori Crouch talk about the legacy of TBN founders Paul and Jan Crouch, and they'll share their vision for the future of the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Matt and Lori join us live. That's later on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Harvard University scientists are taking the first steps toward creating a completely synthetic human genome. The project would allow them to manufacture an entire set of human DNA. They hope it could lead to important medical breakthroughs. Skeptics are concerned scientists will try to manufacture designer humans with the new technology, but scientists are still far from that and are just beginning to understand how to read human DNA. A CBN program in India is now celebrating its 1,000th episode. The show is broadcast in Telugu, a language native to India. So now thousands can hear the gospel in their own language. The show, called Narikshana, airs stories of people that rely on their faith in Jesus through trials and tribulations. It now airs four days a week on a satellite channel, reaching over 300,000 viewers. And it can be viewed in India, Canada, Australia, the Middle East, and even parts of Japan. And you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to cbn.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Well, in 1973, Paul and Jan Crouch started the Trinity Broadcasting Network with one low-power station in Southern California. Today, TBN has 37 owned and operated stations throughout the country, as well as a number of global networks. Take a look. For the last 43 years, the Trinity Broadcasting Network has been offering 24 hours of faith-based inspirational programming to millions of viewers. Since TBN founder Paul Crouch passed away three years ago, his son Matt and Matt's wife Lori have been tasked to carry on his father's legacy. TBN belongs to God's people. Current plans to expand their audience include a new Hillsong channel starting this month and the launch of a new Hispanic network called Salsa. Well, some time ago, Jan Krauss was with me and she said, well, you're the granddaddy of uh, Christian television. I said, well, you know, we're the, we're the fathers of it. and." Uh, we're amazed at what uh, TBN has done, and it's a pleasure to have Matt and Laurie Crouch with us. They've taken on the uh, mantle, so God bless you both. Yeah, Glad to have you with us. Thank, thank, thank you, you sir. What an wow. honor. It's an awesome responsibility. You know, your father was a pioneer. We both were pioneers, and I remember he, the struggles he had in, uh, what was it, Channel 40, whatever that station yeah. was out in Southern California. Yeah. But he, he was a great guy. Every time he was on the show with me, there was an anointing of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what it was. There was a connection that really took Absolutely. place. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, what you got planned? You, you, you're, you've taken the mantle now, and that's a huge operation you've got. Well, what's, what's coming for the future? Well, uh, Brother Pat, we're here, uh, I think, to announce ultimately uh, that Lori and I are all about unity. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd love to partner up with CBN in regard mm -hmm. to some of the foreign channels. We'd love to do some partnering with other channels and, mm -hmm. and, and, and work together. I think my dad uh, came from a generation where he was always expecting the Lord to come back tomorrow. So, you know, there wasn't, there, <laughs> you too, I'm sure, yeah. I know but, how that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so ultimately, uh, it felt like my dad and, you know, your generation saw the finish line mm -hmm. and were running for it. And so I think Gordon and our generation feel like we need to work together, you know, and, and in, in unity. We've partnered, we've just started a new channel with, uh, you know, Hillsong. the Hillsong Group. And that's just been on the air a few days. So those are some of the things that are going on. Uh, I want to assure you, too, Brother Pat, that uh, what we feel uh, very, very uh, important to our generation is 
to be fully spirit empowered, mm -hmm. fully spirit empowered and fully contemporary at the same time. And we've come up with a new term with our friend Leon Fontaine, spirit contemporary. We want everything mm -hmm. about TBN to remain faithful to the roots uh, and just let it represent, you know, what it is in our generation. What's going to happen with Hillsong? They, I, I love their music, uh, you know. Uh, you love Hillsong music? Oh, sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's awesome. So do it, a it, lot of people. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're wonderful yes. people. Yeah. And, uh, but you, you, you're going to have a, 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 like a music channel 24 hours a day? Is it music? Or? Well, I think it would feel more like going to a Hillsong conference. Uh -huh. uh, okay. A lot of speakers, a lot of music, and, and that kind of stuff. So the, the Hillsong brand, 50 million people, this weekend in church will sing Hillsong music Are you globally, serious? 50 that, million. Yeah. And so we just saw that it was time for them to have uh, an entire channel, mm -hmm. and we've made that happen. They're on 11 satellites around the world from day one, 65 million viewers in America alone. Fantastic. So we're just wanting to make a way for uh, that expression, you know, a new yeah. expression. And Pastor Brian has fathered so many amazing mm -hmm. uh, ministries around the world now. There's Hillsong churches in oh, all yeah. kinds of countries, well, you know. Here, great yeah. churches, wonderful friends. Yes, and the, the preachers that are coming out yeah. of Hillsong are just amazing. So we're thrilled well, they that jam that's in people because people love that worship and yes. they really do. But yeah. the, well, y your mother just passed away, and I know there was a great sadness in your heart and in others. Uh, she was a, a pioneering lady and loved by so many. Uh, uh, is there anything out of her legacy that you think well, this is something that ought to carry forward? Yes, sir. A lot. First, a of, lot. All, <laughs> first lot. of all, uh, those that knew my mom knew her as a fighter. Mm -hmm. uh, those that were close enough to know her knew that she was always going to fight for the ministry that God spoke into existence uh, with her and my dad. And, and she fought for her family. She fought for us. Uh, we were almost in a horrible car wreck one time. And when we got home, the Lord had already spoken to her and she was praying for us. And, mm. you know, I mean, she just was always the protector of the ministry of TBN and protected my dad, protected us and protected our family. She, That's she her legacy. Like, like a sweet mother. You could feel that, you know, there was a maternal part amazing. of her. Yeah. Always just a word amazing. in season yeah. for my dad when he was down a word would come out of the Bible just mm -hmm. in time. And, uh, you know, we're just going to, you know, you know, you know what I thought of you, you just led people in a prayer of salvation. Yeah. That's her legacy too. Mm -hmm. The fact that people are being, uh, asked and invited to accept Jesus every day on TBN in multiple languages. That's the legacy of what she wanted. That's what, how she wanted to be known. Well, that's, that's, uh, we'll keep that and, and cherish it, all of us together. All right, you've got a program coming up yourself. What are you going to do? <laughs> well, that was a little bit of her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that was her suggestion. Yeah. Uh, was yeah. It? She hammered me the other day um, about our new uh, thing that we're waking up to Hope and Grace on TBN with uh, Pastor Joseph Prince and Joel Osteen. Mm -hmm. And she said, baby, she said, um, we're love? missing love. <laughs> she <laughs> said, you've got to do something on love. You've got to get Victoria and some of the girls together and do. So that's just kind of coming together. That was something, some of her last wishes. Wishes. Mm -hmm. And um, mom was always my biggest cheerleader. She was always my biggest fan. You know, she was always, you do, you, you go, yeah. you can do whatever, you know. So let we're going to try to make that Let me prove that out. That out. Uh, we were standing with her in the room when she passed, when she took her last breath. Yeah. She had been still, Pat, for a couple of days. And the very last moment, Lori saw the Bible. You know, here's a, here's Bible. a beautiful Bible, Bible. And we had her Bible. And mm -hmm. She put the Bible across her lap in her in her bed and and just said, "Mama, I think it's time." You I know, said, "Mama, they're waiting for you. Everybody's yeah, yeah. waiting for you." I said, "Just go home to be with the Lord." A few seconds later, she, she opened her eyes, yeah. took her last breath while we were there, and she was looking right at right at Lori. And I think that was my mom's way of saying that she loved her more than me. I think that's <laughs> that was her final her final. We don't little talk about that all the time. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, with Gordon, he said, well, she I was mother's favorite. You know, I was that. mother's favorite. Yeah. <laughs> she won. <laughs> but my mama, I love her oh and uh, miss her. And she was a gregarious person, but she was full of love and faith. Yes, and her legacy is. is Jesus on the airwaves. That'll you, continue. You guys have built a, a big empire. You've got all kinds of stations. Are you going to keep all those, the stations and the licenses and all that stuff? Brother Pat, uh, you know how uh, amazingly things are changing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny you'd ask that question uh, because I, I was watching TV. I was watching TBN just, to, just the other night, and I was having to read something. He had to it, have it read by the next day, and so I was a couple hours of reading, but I had TBN on in the background, and I looked up, and my dad was on the air. Mm. So I just grabbed the remote. Lori was asleep next to me, and I turned the, the channel up, and I heard... The first words I heard my dad say is, one day these stations may be obsolete. We never know. And whatever the new technology is, whatever. And, and it was almost like he was speaking to me mm -hmm. from heaven, you know, almost. And, and so we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these spectrum auctions that are coming now and, and all of these things. But I tell you one thing. Jesus is never going to be compromised. That's right. The spirit of uh, a spirit empowered is never going to be compromised. We're never going to move to the middle. So we're going to be fully <laughs> spirit empowered yeah. and we're going to be fully contemporary at the same time. That's what we feel our mantle is. Well, amen. Well, our prayers are with you and I appreciate you being here. God bless you both. You have paved the way. Well, you I, know that. I, 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 I struggled and, you know, uh, a guy who was working with us, who will remain nameless, went out to California and <laughs> teamed up with your father, and he said it was the worst year of his life. And I won't know well, there you go. <laughs> I probably can name a few yeah, others. We, 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 we'll, let's keep that yeah, name. Let's keep that name quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but we we suffered through together, so I know how it is. Right. I'm going to say the name. I'm going to say it right now. No, I'm not. I know that is it. Edit. Boom. I'm gone. <laughs> oh, God bless you both. Thanks for being with we us. We love, love you. you I love you, too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Terry. Well, up next, we're going to bring it on with your email questions. Jessica says, I've caught my husband having sexually explicit conversations with women three times. If my husband hasn't been physically unfaithful, would what is done be considered grounds for divorce? That gets this hot potato when we come back. Well, we want to bring it on with some of the email you've sent in. This first one is from Jessica Pat, who says, I've been married for six years. During that time, I've caught my husband sexually conversing with other women in three instances. He says that he never actually slept with anyone else. It has always been just sexually explicit conversations. The last time I found explicit text messages on his phone. If my husband hasn't been physically unfaithful, would what he's done be considered grounds for divorce? I know God hates divorce, and I just don't want to make a decision that's going to hurt my relationship with God. Well, I'll tell you what Jesus said about that. He said, uh, uh, if somebody uh, looks on a woman uh, with lust and, and conceives in his mind that he is having sex with her, then it's the same thing as the physical act. And um, I think what you're dealing with is an unfaithful husband. Yeah. I think the fact that he's tied in with these ladies, I mean, he's having mental sex with them, and he's giving himself away to them. And uh, if he loves you, he wouldn't be doing that. If, if you love your wife, you're not going to be uh, texting all kinds of dirty stuff with some other woman. You're not going to do that. So you're asking me, is that grounds? The answer, in my opinion, from the Bible is yes, that is grounds. Yeah. That constitutes grounds for divorce. And um, I think he's broken the bonds. Yeah, well, and then excuses it with, it's been just sexually explicit yeah, well, conversations. Yeah, we don't have any physical I mean, contact, really? and I haven't slept with any of them. Yeah, yeah, big deal. All right. This is Diana, who says, I've recently accepted the Lord as my Savior. God has taken me out of a very bad situation, and I'm thankful for that. But I've been looking for a job since October. I go on many interviews, but no one will hire me. I pray every day, but I feel he's not listening to my prayers. Can you tell me why I'm not being favored? Am I hindering my blessing? I have an elderly father to take care of and my teenage son. Um, you may be projecting something. You know, some people project failure. 
they go into a, a conversation and they project failure. There was one man that worked around here, and, and I know this sounds crude, but every time I got around him, I had the desire to kick him. I mean, it was just that. I mean, seriously. Really? I mean, you know, it was just something. He pro projected something that says, I'm a loser. Kick me, you know? I mean, wow. and, and so you go into an interview, and you are projecting failure. You need to project uh, uh, positive thoughts. Mm -hmm. But listen, you're asking for a job. You want them to pay you for something. What is it they're going to pay you for doing? What they want you to do is to fill a slot in their enterprise that will help move them forward. They're not interested in helping you as much as they're asking you helping them. So you need to understand the, the business you're going into. What is it they want? And then say, look, I am the answer to your prayer. I'm here to help you uh, figure out your personnel needs, your sales needs, et cetera. That's all the time we've got, but that's my take on that nice one. Counsel. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from 1 Timothy. Quote, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. That's all the time we've got. Thanks so much for being with us, and we'll look forward to seeing you again at the same time for another edition of The 700 Club. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Bye-bye.